you know, I, I feel that at this moment, at least I have the pragmatic kind of success right now. And I still struggle with the creative sense of success. I still find myself working in response to pressures rather than working in response to something like inspiration. What does it really take to become successful as a writer or artist? There are a lot of destructive myths out there about what a creative career is supposed to look like. We're told we shouldn't care about worldly success or money. We're told that if we're good enough, everything would magically fall into place. That's a lie, and it keeps us struggling, baffled, and hungry for any shred of information that might shed light on how to keep making the work we love. That's why I get any two artists or writers or any creatives really together in a room, and it's a foregone conclusion that the conversation will turn to money and the nitty gritty reality of being a professional creative. I'm cartoonist and creative business coach, Jessica Abel. In my own life, those studio visit back channel conversations with other artists where we share our insights and hacks, anxieties and red flags have been critical to any success I've achieved. And now I'm bringing that conversation to you. This is The Autonomous Creative. This episode is a bit of a departure for The Autonomous Creative. It's a panel discussion I moderated with three dynamic young artists about navigating the difficult transition from school to the working world. Each of them is following a unique path, and it was so valuable to dig into the similarities and differences between their worlds. Brendan Keene, Mariel Capanna, and Brittany Bennett all graduated from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, where I teach and lead the illustration department. And it was such a blast to get to know them during this panel. Tons of surprises to come right after this. This episode of The Autonomous Creative is brought to you by The Creative Engine. I talk to working creative people all the time, both on the show and in our membership, The Autonomous Creative Collective, and one of the biggest challenges they struggle with is procrastination. To most people, it feels like it's just a permanent character flaw, like they were born that way and doomed to suffer, but that's just absolutely untrue. Art is hard, yes, and we will all feel resistance to using that much cognitive energy on anything. But procrastination typically stems from specific root causes that are totally fixable. If your creative work is essential to you and who you are and your life, yet you still struggle with procrastination and it just feels like this is crazy, I want to invite you to check out the free Creative Engine Masterclass. This class will help you overcome your resistance and put your priorities first before you're derailed by everything else. The Creative Engine is a complete, simple, straightforward, and powerful framework that will help you pinpoint where your creative process breaks down and highlight exactly how to fix it. In it, you'll master the four essential phases of the creative process you need to produce awesome work reliably. And you're probably skipping at least one, possibly two. You'll learn how to predict and avoid the pitfalls that derail you time and time again. And you'll overcome self-sabotage take back control, and keep moving even when things get really challenging. This class is totally free, and you will get immediate deep clarity into what makes your creative life tick. So stop procrastinating and start finishing your most important creative projects by harnessing the power of your own creative engine at jessicaable.com slash engine. That's J-E-S-S-I-C-A-A-B-E-L dot com slash engine. Now, let's start the show. First of all, I would like to introduce Brendan Keen. Brendan is an artist and fabricator currently based in West Philadelphia. He was a transfer student at PAFA where he majored in sculpture, and he graduated with a BFA in 2012 and was awarded the William Emlyn Crescent Memorial Travel Scholarship, which meant he stayed a fifth year at PAFA and received a certificate degree in 2013. When he finished school, he joined the West Philly-based arts collaborative studio and workshop, the Philadelphia Traction Company. Along with other artists at Traction, he exhibited his sculpture and collaborative works in Philadelphia and San Francisco. For the past eight years, Brendan has worked full-time as a self-employed artist and fabricator, creating sculptural installations for public and private clients, including the Logan Hotel, the W Hotel, the Discovery Center, and private residences. In between jobs, Brendan travels wherever possible, including across Western Europe and around Iceland via bicycle, 
and most recently across the U.S. in a DIY sprinter camper van, which sounds amazing, sounds super fun. And I'm sure it's highly, knowing fabricators, it's probably very, very customized. Am I right? Lots of custom stuff in your camper van? Yeah, yeah. I definitely took four times as long as it should to build, but I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually currently in Moab uh, right now. Are you? Uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. All right. Secondly, I would like to introduce Mariel Capana. Um, Marielle is a fine artist specializing in fresco who graduated with a BFA from PAFA in 2012. And she was also awarded the Crescent Travel Scholarship, which means she also spent an extra year at PAFA and was awarded a certificate in 2013. She re received her MFA from Yale School of Art in 2020. She attended Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 2017. And she's exhibited at many places, including Adams and Ullman in Portland, Central Park in Los Angeles, uh, Rose McLeaf gallery in Philadelphia and good weather in North Little Rock, Arkansas, Coop or co-op. I'm probably co-op, right? Coop. I had to play on, play on words there. Coop in Nashville and the Bowtie Project in Los Angeles. She's also been the recipient of numerous residencies and fellowships in addition to the Crescent. Um, and I'm not going to list them all right here, but they are impressive. And I think that's going to be something that we definitely want to talk about as far as your trajectory. Mariel currently serves as a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the studio art at Williams College and a fresco instructor at the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. And her ongoing project, Little Stone, Open Home, With Good Weather, is a long-term and perpetually changing fresco in a single car garage in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Fascinating. I love that. Okay, so our third um, guest tonight is Brittany Bennett. Brittany Bennett is a medical illustrator who graduated from the joint PAFA pen program in 2014. At PAFA, Brittany focused on academic oil painting and graphite drawing. Her work from this time is the result of meticulous observation of textures in nature and a celebration of details. After PAFA, she completed a graduate program for medical and biological illustration at Johns Hopkins. She credits PAFA with strengthening her artistic skill and graduate school for strengthening communication and business practice. She currently works at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, where half her week is in Stream Studios, servicing the hospital network at large. And the other half, she runs River, a medical illustration service just for the radiology department. She's an artist with training in biology, anatomy, and visual, visual communication who creates didactic illustrations and other visual aids. Brittany works with medical professionals at CHOP to produce patient education materials, figures for scientific literature, illustrated surgical training guides, 3D anatomical models, and more. All right. Thank you all for being here. And uh, thanks for those impressive bios. It was fun to get, like dive into your websites and see all the stuff. So what I wanted to start with is, and I'm, and I'm kind of going to ask each of these questions to the three of you, and we'll just go around. And then if there's anything that you want to ask about somebody else's statements or add to it, please do. So the first one I want to get into is just to get a sort of snapshot of today is how do you make a living now? And how does creative work fit into how you make a living? Uh, Brendan, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I, I primarily make a living through working for interior designers. So they'll bring me projects from private clients or uh, commercial properties. Occasionally, I'll get something through a traction company. And um, I'll work on it either alone or with other people, other members through Trip Traction Company, which has been super helpful. And uh, so I've met a few designers years and they've really just kept me employed, which is nice. Uh, so my, my work fluctuates enormously. Like I'll work, you know, 16 hour days for five months and then I'll disappear for five months and, and um, or I won't have any work at all. So it's, it's very, my, so my lifestyle is very dramatically up in the air and and uh, all over the place. Do you like that? Yeah, it is. It's exhausting in its in, in its own way because I, I don't think it's for everybody. Some people really like the, I know I'm getting a paycheck on this date and I know what's happening two weeks from now, um, which is really nice. So part of me is like, oh, that sounds great. Like I haven't had that in near a decade now. So um, so I guess I've sort of gotten used to it. And, and it's just like, every time I get paid, it's always a big event. It's just like, oh yeah, I don't have to work for a minute. So it's, it's always this like, you know, very emotional roller coaster for me. It's like, I'll get a big job or, or especially like recently I've done big jobs that have been 
like just I won't get paycheck for like six months or something like that. And then it's just like I get paid and it's just like, all right, I'm retiring right now. <laughs> so it's like I don't know. I don't know if I can do it forever. It's it's uh it's that's a tough question that I, I ask myself all the time. Do you have systems around smoothing out the financial picture so that like when you get a big payday, you have ways of sort of like parceling it out to yourself? I was not spending it on fun toys. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, not really. I'll like put some away and like, I've gotten pretty good. You know, like tools really eat up a lot of money for, for my, what I do. Like, it's really easy for me to spend, you know, five grand on a new whatever. And then it's just like, oh, well, now there's, there's my profit or whatever. But, um, it's, it takes a little self-control to be like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go out to eat every day for the next five months because I don't know if I'm getting paid, but, uh, um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as an author, I know what that's like, you know, you get an advance and then it could be a year or two before you get, you know, another chunk of money for that. So it's like thinking about those kinds of ups and downs. I, I think like, you know, I, 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 I try to live simply and, you know, I don't need fancy things. I spend well, most of my savings on traveling and, um, and like, I have everything, you know, in my personal life more that I like, you know, I don't, I don't have a big house. I don't have a mortgage. Um, right now I'm not paying rent, which is great. Or, or any any living expenses because I'm living out of my camper van right now uh, in the middle of the desert at the moment. So I'm just spending money on gas and food and, you know, it's very, very simple lifestyle at the moment, um, which, which is nice. Like I have, you know, I know a lot of my peers or my cousins, you know, they're buying houses and having kids. And, and uh, so uh, I think it's conducive to my current lifestyle, I would say. Having kids and a mortgage would certainly, you know, be a whole other level of stress added right, onto that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Sort of the next, the next thing that comes up, right? Like where, <laughs> well, where yeah. you, how do you like make the next transition? That's, well, we're going back to the last transition first. So yeah. Yeah. Um, Marielle, how about you? So um, at this point, my, uh, I make a living primarily through the sale of oil paintings through gallery sales. Um, I also have uh, this postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Williams College, which is a salaried position that comes with a studio, a subsidized apartment, and really um, generous health care. Um, so, yeah, that's my situation. Okay. And is that like a limited, that's a thing that you can do for a year or two years or something like that? It's a, it's a two-year fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there's some possibility that I could be able to extend it in one way or another. Um, you know, if I were to choose to continue to live in Williamstown or in the Berkshires, I might be able to continue working for the college. Um I'm not sure, but, but yeah, for now it's, it's a, a two-year contract. Great. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, Brittany. Yeah. And then for me, I'm a full-time salary employee at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP. Um, and that came about because my two bosses, the one in radiology and the one in, um, ENT, ear, nose and throat, um, are both sort of doctors and also artists and felt that medical illustration is a really important thing and started this position um, and started a kind of studio medical illustration practice within CHOP. Uh, but we do have to, me and my, my colleague EO Trueblood, the other illustrator do have to um, kind of do our own scouting in, within CHOP for research teams, nursing teams, um, who might benefit from our work and bring bring in their um, business to our studio within shop? It's kind of an interesting dynamic, right? So you're still kind of finding clients, but they're it's within this inner circle of people who are there, and they then they would like attribute a portion of their budget, presumably, to your studio. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Um, and they so this is something that was it didn't exist before. Yes, we were founded nine years ago when, when EO um, came to Dr. Brian Dunham 
in ENT and asked um, basically for a job or a position. The funny thing is EO, um, myself and Dr. Denham all studied at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. um, so we all kind of had this little network starting out. And when EO went to Dr. Dunham uh, and asked to start to, like for a job, essentially, he not only said, yeah, but um, Dr. Dunham got really excited about starting a studio practice at CHOP, medical illustration. And then the kind of um, practice in radiology where I am part-time was like a branch off of that. Really interesting. Great. Um, okay. So why don't we stay with you for a second, Brittany? And uh, my second question is, can you tell us a little bit about what your working day looks like? <laughs> oh, geez. It's like emails for the first hour, <laughs> emails and project management. Since I'm usually juggling uh, like three ENT, you know, general hospital projects and then like three radiology projects at the same time. So meeting some project managing for that. And then I try to have at least, at least three to five good hours of the day be actual production time where I, um, I have a Cintiq at my desk, which is like a really large drawing tablet, um, that you draw directly on digitally. Um, and I try to have like, you know, partition this time is their emails, but there's, <laughs> there's gotta be a good chunk of the day where I'm actually doing production work. Yeah, for sure. Otherwise, the emails would go nowhere, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But I am like project management is a big, is a larger part of um, my medical illustration job than I thought it would be originally. Um, but I like that. I like client communication um, and making sure everything's going smoothly. Um, yeah. Is that the case for you also, Brendan, with your commissions? Uh, in what way? I mean, project management, you know, client oh. management, going back and forth. And, you know, does it, does it surprise, did it surprise you how much that's a part of what you do or is it a big part of what you do? Um, yeah, it, it, it is. It, it, it definitely ebbs and flows. Like it really depends on the client that I have at any moment. Like some private clients, generally, usually private clients are, are, are way more chill and they're just like, you know, they get it. It's just like stuff doesn't happen in two seconds after you get paid you know or whatever but like i've had a few commercial clients and they're just it, it it's it's exhausting trying to navigate you know it's like the too many cooks in a kitchen to mm -hmm. a tea like you have 800 people like having opinions and it's just like well who do i listen to and like 50 people have to approve anything before anything gets done so it's just like the slowest thing ever sometimes you know and it's just like dealing with people on site like union and architects and it's sometimes just like well you know what you figure it out i'll come back when you're you know have your stuff together <laughs> yeah well the physical installation is a whole other level right that's that's a whole thing that yeah yeah like uh, insurance insurance sucks generally um and it depends you go to a private residence you can just have general liability and depending on what you're doing it's like nice and easy and simple like i was in a you know hotel and it's just like or I was in a, a high rise in Manhattan and they required like at this outrageous list of insurance that I had to get specifically for this job that ran nine months. And, um, you know, like I was paying $5,000 just in insurance for this one job and, um, all that stuff, it's no fun, you know, but it's just like, it's generally over in the beginning. It's like you spend a day or, you know, whatever, ironing out those insurance things or, or like logistical things. And then, and then. And then generally you don't have to worry about it unless something really bad happens, but, uh, which I, I have never had to deal with, but just, you know, pay the bill. <laughs> right. Um, Brittany, how long do your projects typically take? Mm, uh, the fastest turnaround would be about two weeks. Something gets a little straightforward. And then a longer project could be about six months, maybe nine months. So like a multi-image thing or just a really big complex image? Sometimes I do, um, videos that involved 2D illustrations, um, voiceover work, script writing, um, as well as maybe 3D animated components. So those that would be a larger project. Mm -hmm. Great. Mariel, how does your work life look these days? Well, it's, it's changed recently. So last semester was my first semester in my position at, at Williams College as the postdoctoral fellow. And 
this fellowship is specifically a, a craft and material based fellowship. So, um, I applied with and was accepted with a focus on fresco painting. So I'm teaching, uh, one fresco course per semester, which is a really light course load, like a very friendly course load, but nonetheless, during my first semester here, um, you know, as friendly as that course load was just teaching fresco to anyone, let alone in a college context, it was just, it was a ton of work to, to build out the shop, to source all of the materials, um, to figure out, you know, I mean, just building the syllabus, it just, it ended up being a ton of work and then lots of one-on-one -on -one time with students. So though I had this studio that was given to me as part of the fellowship, I neglected it entirely for an, for one whole semester. And toward the beginning of the semester, I kept telling myself like, okay, once I find my footing, I'm going to start going to my studio every day. And that kept not happening. And so at a certain point, I realized that just feeling guilty or feeling like my energy should be split in two different places. It just, that wasn't going to be good for me and it wasn't going to be good for my students. So I just decided this is my semester where I learn how to teach and I focus on teaching. And I just, I, I didn't even walk to my studio once. Um, and I'm glad that I did that because, you know, especially when I'm trying something new, I benefit from giving my full attention to that one thing. And I know this from having spent so many years running around like a headless chicken, trying to do too many things at once. So, um, this has been a new thing for me is just letting myself do one thing at a time, whenever humanly possible. Um, this semester I've now found my footing and I figured out how to teach this class. So it's a lot easier for me to show up once a week and do what I need to do. And then the rest of my time is spent in my studio. I uh, have a couple of very big deadlines right now. So for the past couple of months, I've been in my studio from probably 8 a.m. till 6.30 p.m. most days uh, with, you know, a healthy lunch break in the middle. Um, and then over the past few days, those hours have been a little bit longer just out of necessity. And those deadlines are for shows? Yeah. In this case, it's for, it's for shows of oil paintings. Yeah. Um, I was showing one group of paintings at the Lista Art Fair in Switzerland in June. And then I have a show at Adams and Ullman in Portland, Oregon in July. Okay, great. I mean, do you have other kinds of deadlines that come up? Or is it usually like there's a show or of course a class? I mean, you have to prep your class. I mean, but are there other things like that for you? Other kinds of deadlines? Well, I mean, I've taken on a couple of odd projects here and there. Last year, I developed a, and created a fresco in a long hallway in a private home in California. So that had its own deadline that was maybe a, a bit closer to maybe what Brendan is describing for a lot of his projects. Um, but yeah, I mean, show deadlines are always a kick in the pants for me to do a lot of painting very quickly. Um, and to date that has worked, um, something happens, new things happen. I am usually by the end of it all happy enough with the work I produce, but I am trying to imagine and maybe create for myself, um, you know, a, a studio world where I'm making things regularly without the pressure of a deadline. Um, and the only times when I've experienced that have been in the context of residencies, um, you know, these nice little experiences where somehow you manage to flee all of the pressures of the normal world. Yeah. Little, little windows of non-time or something, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Brendan, you've already told us that your time fluctuates enormously, but in a moment when you actually are uh, working on a commission, um, what does your what does it, that look like for you? Um, uh, the last one I had, uh, I had two big jobs running at the same time. I had one in Rittenhouse and one in Manhattan. And, um, I had, I had not full time, but I had like five people working for me and I, I would, I had to, a lot of my time was ordering materials and figuring out what everybody was going to do, you know, and, um, and when they were going to do it and how long they were actually going to take to do those things. But, um, and everything is just the best guess and, you know, figuring out how long some of these things um, are going to take. Because every, everything I build, everything's a one-off. Like, I don't make, like, 500 of, you know, one thing. And um, so it's it's always just best guess. And, and I, I get, there's, there's a lot of, like, just having the materials on hand when I need them. Um, which can really slow you down, like depending on what it is, like you got to wait three weeks, you got to wait, whatever, or you can have some things delivered next day, which is awesome. Um, but for the, for those jobs, it was, a, it was a lot of project management, which at first I, for, for that, I was like the most intense version of project management or people management that I probably will ever experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I manage, I, you know, I would wake up in the middle of the night and be like, oh my God, I forgot to do something, or I don't know when tomorrow. How about we all just take a vacation? You know, it's just like, <laughs> but I, uh, I, yeah, I guess, I guess that. It sounds um, like there's a lot of, I mean, there's obviously a design phase, which is more you in your head, your studio, like working things out, maybe going back and forth with the client. But when you're actually in, in implementation phase, when you're fabricating. It's true. There's a lot of logistics, right? I mean, it's sort of being a contractor. Yeah, yeah, in many ways. Yeah, I, I wear I wear many hats. So like, like in in the beginning, it, it's true. There's like these definite phases of like all the red tape stuff in the beginning, where it's you know figuring out how much they want to pay for something and um, and drawings. Like sometimes the drawing phase takes forever. And uh, I have a friend that I work with, and he does really nice uh, computer renderings for me, and we'll like work out some of the, like you know how does this fit to this? How does that bolt to that? And oh, will this kill somebody? You know, you know, or uh, and so. That that phase, and then and then once that's over, and then I get like thumbs up from the client, I can I can just you know start spending all my money that they give me to to make it happen. And then that phase usually is the longest phase, and then generally there's the install phase after that, um, and then and then the praying that they don't call me later phase about anything that's wrong. I guess it's after that. But uh, uh, I I uh, yeah, so okay. I, I guess it's a little different from for each phase, but. You know, yeah. the instant phase is always very stressful. But no, I mean, it, I think that it's clear from everybody here. There's like just, there's, there are many more parts of your job than maybe you expected when you were in school. So we're going to go back to school now. I'm going to ask you about the very beginning of this journey, because I really want to ask you about what happened when you first graduated. I'm going to start with Marielle this time, just to, just to change it up. Um, when you first graduated, how did you navigate those first few years? Like what, what were the first steps that you took from student to professional? What were the fears you had about it? Just talk to me a little bit about what that was like for you. Okay. Let me think back. So, um, like Brendan, I had a Crescent Travel Scholarship, um, and that summer of travel that I had between my uh, BFA year and my certificate year was enormously important to me for a number of reasons. Um, but maybe most importantly, I just discovered that um, that being alone and traveling alone and making decisions alone was really good for me and for my creative practice. And so after graduating from PAFA, I applied for a what was a, actually a very small grant in retrospect. It felt big at the time, but my proposal was, I mean, I definitely went in the red. So I applied for something called the Kittredge Fund um, and and proposed that I was going to travel across and around the country and 30,000 miles of curly cues, um, collecting all of this 
kind of landscape imagery that was related to the paintings I was making at the time. And I was given this grant. I am sure that I spent three times more money than what I was actually granted, but I did end up spending an entire year alone in my car looking. And um, while I was on that trip, I stumbled into some series of ideas that led me to the, and I don't even remember what was it. I, I don't know, but there was something that made me think I need to learn how to paint frescoes. I think, I think it was in part just, I was thinking so much about, about place and about the relationship between imagery and place. And I liked the idea of learning how to make a kind of painting that stayed put and was really part of its, just a, a fixed architectural part of its physical environment. And so um, after this year of travel, I was nominated for an Independence Foundation Visual Arts Fellowship, which is a Philadelphia-based fellowship. And I proposed that I should travel to Florence to study fresco painting with a conservator. And so I did that. Um, I'm realizing that my story can potentially be way too long, so I'm going to figure out how to <laughs> cut it a little shorter. But after learning how to make frescoes, I moved to Los Angeles following a relationship, um, actually a relationship with a, a for another PAFA student. Um, and I worked by night as a waitress and as a line cook at several different restaurants. So I worked nearly every night in order to pay the bills. And by day, I volunteered for an artist who I admired very much. And when I first landed in Los Angeles, I just, I emailed so many people saying, I'm interested in the work you do. How can I help? You don't need to pay me. I have a job as a waitress. I just want to be involved. And I ended up working with this artist, Rafa Esparza, who then invited me to make a fresco on his wall. And so I might just say et cetera at this point rather than continuing to spell it out. But um, what I found is that after PAFA, I had an enormous amount of energy and curiosity. And I went with that momentum and really let one thing lead to another, which ended up leading to another. Um, and it's because of Fresco, I am sure that I got into Scout Egan in the first place and now work there every summer as a Fresco associate. So it was just like one odd little idea that ended up really giving me some momentum. Well, and being able to, being willing to commit to that idea without having any idea any notion of where it would go. I mean, you were, didn't say like, I'm going to learn fresco so that I can teach a scout Hegan, you know, like right. you just have to follow that, you know, sort of mission to do something. Were you, was it scary when you were in those first few years? Like, were you nervous about how you're going to get to whatever the next stage was? Were you, did, did that feel? You know, it's funny because I am so not nervous now. I'm I look back and think, oh, what a wonderful time that was, the, you know, 10 years after graduating from PAFA. Um, but in reality, I had many tearful days and nights of feeling very concerned about what am I doing? Did I choose the right path? Will I ever make a living? Will I be a waitress forever? Which would be actually fine, but that isn't how it turned out. Um, uh, yeah. It, it was scary. Um, and it was, yeah, I felt, I felt stressed and I felt financially quite stressed. Um, and luckily there was always something, whether it was like an apprenticeship or a small grant or a, there was always something to kind of keep me going right when I was thinking of, you know, hopping off that path. Great. Thank you. Um, Brittany, why don't you tell us a little bit about those transition years? So when I was at PAFA um, early on, I knew I wanted to 
I try to become a medical illustrator. And I think I started looking at like job listings and looking at what the different um, qualifications and uh, skills that different employers wanted, like for things that were my dream job. And I tried to like think of those as check boxes and try to like acquire all of those skills and mm -hmm. be able to do all those things. And so I was, and maybe I still am this way, very methodical and calculated about um, building my career, I guess. And um, I applied for graduate school at Johns Hopkins at, at the end of my time at PAFA. And I, this was my dream program. Like I thought this was everything I was working for. <laughs> everything I was making at PAFA almost was like for this portfolio for entrance. And I didn't get in um, that, that first time I applied. And I was so heartbroken and I felt so defeated, but I was like, I'm going to try one more time. And if that doesn't work out, I'll maybe think about joining some kind of like painting commune or something, <laughs> maybe like a tattoo artist, maybe it's not for me, but, um, I, I was committed for that next year to focus on reapplying and, um, very, very fortunately, uh, I was awarded the Anne Bryan Memorial Scholarship and Venture Fund to help fund that year that I spent um, doing things to reapply. And this was basically I had to study and take the GRE for entrance. Um, I, w because uh, <laughs> I moved in with my grandpa, who was the best roommate ever to save money, um, I took any kind of job illustration job that um, came at me and through my website, um, some people did find me. I did some work for like a, a medical device company, um, having like very little experience in actual medical illustration um, and a kind of large project for um, Dr. Damon Santola at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and that, that was a, my first big uh, project where I was working with kind of a big time client from my perspective then, and just figuring it out as I went. <laughs> um, I was also, because I had the funding, I was able to seek out more projects that would, that were fulfilling and that would help um, my chances in reapplying. So I reached out to my biology professor at Penn. I really liked it, or he was the um, comparative vertebrate anatomy professor. Um, and this is where we dissected like stingrays and snakes and fish and stuff and kind of looked at all their anatomy. Um, I said, you know, in your lab, the handouts actually have some really bad illustrations. They're like from Google. They're not even correct most of the time. Like the lab instructor kept, you know, saying like, well, it's not really like this, but just pretend like I would love to spend this summer um, coming in and making some new diagrams for you because there weren't things like scientific and illustration internships. There weren't like <laughs> opportunities out there that I could find. So I'm like, I'm just going to make this one, um, for myself. And I did that, which was really cool, really fulfilling <laughs> and fun. Um, so those get used in like the lab handouts now. Um, I was going to like local figure drawing sessions just to keep that, you know, muscle um, warmed up and also trying to learn some new skills. Like I didn't know 3D at all. So I downloaded a, a free program called Sculptress and kind of taught myself some digital sculpting and um, brushed up on digital painting, which I didn't do a whole lot of at PAFA. So it was a time for like skill development. Um, and stuff until I, I did get into grad school, uh, the next time I applied because they wanted to see, um, more storytelling in my work. They said it was very observation heavy, which coming from PAFA, of course, <laughs> but they wanted us to see that I could tell scientific stories and explain things with the work. So having infographics can end these, um, illustrations for the, um, the anatomy lab really helped. Um, and then after grad school, I kind of just 
really fortunately, um, String Studios at, at CHOP was hiring and I had already kind of formed a relationship with um, EO Trueblood and Dr. Brian Dunham. Um, and I kind of just landed there pretty Because easy. they were also from your school. That's why yeah. you already had a relationship with them? I actually reached out to them in 2013 when I think I was a second year um, because that was EO Trueblood's first year um, at what is now Stream Studios, but at CHOP. And I was like, I think I Googled like Philadelphia Medical Illustrator and somehow found him and kind of cold called. It was like, your job sounds so cool. Can I, like, can we chat? I would love, I was just so excited. And he and Dr. Dunham were so kind and invited me to the studio to show me how their day was there. And I was like, that's it. This is my dream job. Um, and I just kind of kept in touch since then. Amazing. I love that. And it's, it has a lot in common with Mariel's story in terms of just reaching out to people and saying like, I love what you do. How can I know more? Can we do something? And, and being brave about that is super, super important, obviously. Right? I think everyone has been in that position. So most people are very happy to help someone. Yeah. I mean, if they possibly can, right? The, if they have room for that, that I think, I, I do think that people are willing to have that conversation for sure. Brendan, what were your first few years out of PAFA like? How did you make the transition to getting these kind of big time clients and meeting? I mean, you said you have, a, you work with a lot of interior designers. How did that come about? Uh, it was, it was slow in the beginning, um, just like anything, but, uh, uh, I think I gave a big shout out to John Gregg because he, he really helped me out, you know, and like having the support network that is traction company, it was really big. And, uh, you know, being able to build, build stuff for people requires a lot of stuff and space and, and things that cost a lot of money if you had to buy it all by yourself and landing at traction company, you know, they, we just pulled everything together and it was really cool, you know, and like other people were there struggling the same way you were and there was, we could all struggle together. So. Um, it definitely made it, you know, doable or felt doable, you know, like it, it didn't feel like I was just drifting into the ether of the world in, in the sense, but. So um, what is Traction Company? Like, how does it function? Is it a collaborative, like an artist collaborative or is it a studio? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a collection of, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think it still is uh, almost entirely of half of students. Might hmm. be one. And, um, and. Yeah. So like it's, it's function is different, you know, entities or, you know, like it, it's sometimes like, you know, a few years ago, like we all worked on one project for the community or like, you know, it, it, sometimes there's nothing really happening. Everyone just has their own studio there and everybody's doing their own thing. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, fills the bill for whatever is sort of happening in, in whoever's a member at the time, sort of like, well, I have a big project, but I need like eight people to do this. And like, is anybody else interested? And, um, so it made, it made taking on larger projects way less intimidating, you know, like, you know, if mm -hmm. you have the space and, and like people that, that are willing to help, you know, and like people, oh, I, I can hire my friends right, right there. Um, you know, definitely makes things less stressful, I think. And, um, I, I, it was really, it's still really hard for me to sort of manage my stress and it still is, you know, it's just like a constant roller coaster that is my decision-making apparently. Well, one thing I really wish I did more when I was starting out or I could still do is just reach out to people and uh, make more of those sort of connections in like a cold calls sort of way. And, and, uh, I think that's, that's like a really awesome thing to, to, to do. And, and, uh, I got lucky a couple of times, you know, I met one designer and gave me enough work for, you know, years. And, um, and, uh, so it's just like, you never know who you're going to meet. And it's just like, oh, this one random guy who, went to someone else actually at PAPA and then they couldn't do the job and, and then she recommended me. And then, so I ended up, you know, just making that one connection through another student at PAPA. And, um, and then, and then, yeah, I mean, I, like that, you know, one designer just basically kept food on the table for a long time. Um, but like in the beginning, it was, it was me, Stephen Daly and Jake Looney. We were all travel scholarship winners ripping up carpets for a whole summer in like this terribly hot building in, in North Philly. And, uh, it, it was, it didn't look very good, <laughs> but, uh, um, 
yeah but you know it's what i guess it's worth it in the end right <laughs> yeah for sure so but so you, still for you it's like because you're in this collective then you have you get referrals from other people you get to work on their jobs for money they introduce you to people and that's how this whole thing sort of got rolling for you yeah yeah i mean yeah largely it was a lot of it was traction company like if, if i didn't have that spots land like i you know i, I have no idea where I, where i would have ended up but um yeah I, you know it's just like because it, everybody there hears about a job and maybe it's not their cup of tea or down their you know skill set and it just sort of finds its way for whoever it is whoever wants it or needs it and um, you know, a lot of time just sort of say yes you know more probably more than you should but um you say yes stuff that, that comes up and and you try to do it and you figure out how to do it along the way and and um you know some of them don't go anywhere but some of them are cool and you're proud to yeah i know you're deeply committed to your creative work and yet when it comes time to make the thing it's like you short circuit your inner critic comes roaring out and shuts you down you find your attention dragged off by some other shiny new object you can't stop feeling guilty and that you should be focusing on paid work your clients, your children, friends, boss, parents constantly demand your attention. Here's the thing, there is nothing wrong with you. There's just a breakdown somewhere in your creative engine and you can repair it. I wanna invite you to join me for the free Creative Engine Masterclass where you'll learn which tactics will backfire when you're trying to get traction on self-generated creative projects and what to do instead. The four essential phases of the creative process you must implement to produce awesome work reliably, and you're probably skipping at least one. The good news hidden in your long history of valiant efforts to make your creative life work, how to diagnose what's off track and keep moving on your work even when things get really challenging, and the secret to how to predict and avoid the pitfalls that derail you time and time again. This class is totally free and you will get immediate deep clarity into what makes your creative life tick and the specific next step to take to harness the power of your own creative engine. So stop procrastinating and start finishing your most important creative projects when you join the Creative Engine Masterclass at jessicaabel.com slash engine. That's J-E-S-S-I-C-A-A-B-E-L dot com slash engine. Okay, back to the show. Um, what does success uh, look like to you at this point? And is it different from when you were just graduating? Success, I don't know. It's a, it's um, a my, problematic word, I know. But I mean, what does sort of, um, yeah, what does, what does it mean? I guess that's a good question. Like I, I, have, I have weird stresses from my overachieving family that sort of make, that hard for me to define i don't know part of me rebels against them in some way of just like doing my own thing but um i suppose being free to make my own decisions about what to do day to day and um mm -hmm. and i've uh it never really thrived in a nine to five environment of you know just following the clock uh to a t forever and uh so i guess that's a, a big part of how i live my life um but um yeah i guess yeah and being able to travel i know i love traveling and i mean that re represents freedom right it represents you're having total control over your schedule and your physical location and all that other stuff right that you you are making all the decisions yeah yeah totally cool mariel what what's what do you think about this question? What does success look like to you, and is it different mm -hmm. than what you thought it would be? Um, so I think there's there's a a kind of practical side of this question for me. Um, you know, pragmatically, success means uh, having and maintaining financial stability and um, professional conditions and life conditions under which I can get a full night's sleep and eat well and exercise and maintain relationships with the people who 
matter most to me. Um, and creatively in my studio, success, or I, I think I feel success when I, um, when I feel that I am following the path of my own interests. I, I mean, maybe it's also a, a kind of feeling of freedom that the thing that is driving my work and my practice is, um, is me. It's something coming from me and it's not an external pressure. Like what do people expect of me or what does this gallery want from me or, um, and you know, I, I feel that at this moment, at least I have the first half, you know, I have the pragmatic kind of success right now. And I still struggle with, you know, the, the creative sense of success. I still find myself, um, often working in response to pressures rather than working in response to something like inspiration. I love that. Thank you. Brittany, your turn. Yeah. <laughs> I thankfully I had some time to think about that one. <laughs> That's such a hard question. I think um, earlier, when, maybe when I first, when I was like finishing Kafka, I would have thought um, like peer recognition, some of these like big scholarships, big awards that, um, you know, are very important at PAPA. I would have thought, you know, notoriety like that was success, but uh, personally, that was really toxic for me, <laughs> and I like to get away from that. And now I kind of feel like um, success is like, for me, being able to do something that I wasn't able to do a year ago, that I had set kind of my sights on, you know, a year ago. And once you, it, it's, yeah, in some ways, an, um, in, what do they call it, like an ever-moving goalpost? <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you just keep making new goals for yourself. But I, I think success is like achieving some of those personal goals and interests, like Mariel said. Um, it's less outward, less external, and a lot more internal now. Um, and another one, like the smaller successes, the daily successes, are when projects go smoothly. That, I get a lot of sense of, of, of fulfillment and success from like the client communication was good it went through the proper amount of revisions and that was smooth the client is happy you know my my bosses were impressed by it that's to me successful and then you know moving forward I don't like to stay stagnant I like to grow so moving forward increasingly complex projects and they never go smooth the first time, <laughs> like, but as you keep doing them, they do get to go a little smoother. And that's what I, that's when I feel successful. Do you let yourself celebrate when you feel successful? Uh, that's one, uh, that's one thing I really struggle with is like realizing at the time that it was successful. Usually it's like when I look back you know, or when I have something later to compare it to, I was like, no, I actually mm -hmm. did do pretty good then. So. Right. That's the problem with moving goalposts, right? That like, by the time you finish a thing, you're like, yeah, but what about that thing? And, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Not being able to just say like, Hey, look what I did. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard. It's really hard. Um, right. Well, we're going to, wrap up in just a few minutes. I guess the, the last question I wanted to ask you, and we had a couple of questions from one of our attendees, but um, the last question I wanted to ask generally is, um, since this is uh, an event that's designed around younger artists coming to various fields, what do you wish you had known when you were still enrolled at PAFA about, you know, in terms of being ready for leaving? <laughs> Very well. Um, so the thing that's coming to mind is, so when I was graduating from graduate school, I got a really lovely email from a critic who is actually the, the trickiest and most challenging of my critics, um, Rob Storr, 
And his email, the, the most important nugget that I got from this email was he said, don't force the flower. Um, you know, the idea being you can't force a flower to bloom. It, it will just happen. Just trust that it's going to happen at some point. Um, and I think a lot of the, you know, I'd say nearly every faculty member who I worked with at PAFA will probably have a memory of me weeping in my studio. Just, it, it just happened all the time. I was just so, I was so worried. I was putting so much pressure on myself. I don't, I just, um, and I think a lot of it was, uh, trying to force the flower. Um, and something that I have realized is, you know, while you can't force the flower, what I can do, what is in my power is to create and foster the conditions for something to grow. Um, and this is true in my studio and it's true in my life that just setting up the conditions for something to happen is step one. And then the other thing is just being attentive and patient and being there and available to notice something good that's happening. And in order to notice when something good is happening, I, it does take a certain amount of calm. Um, so, you know, what I wish that I had done more often at PAFA was slow down, get more sleep, take my time, meditate, or just breathe deeply more often, um, take long walks. I, uh, just, there were so many wonderful things happening at that school that I did enjoy and I got so much out of my time there but I am sure that I could have gotten so much more if I had just relaxed. I love your focus on building sustainability into your life as a necessary component of having an artistic practice that is productive and is satisfying and gets you where you want to be. It's just gets missed so often. I just love to hear you articulate that. Yeah. Brendan, how about you? I think in the beginning, I, I, I placed too much emphasis on making money through my, my creative work, through stuff that I wanted to make, and it, some sort of validation from it. And I think that sort of tainted the whole experience a little bit. And, and it's, it's been really hard for me to have like the, the, the like conversation with myself that, uh, making, making work for yourself is independently important rather than just making stuff to, for other people. Um, and I think that's okay. You know, it's like, you you can still be rewarding if you just make your stuff for yourself and if somebody wants it cool whatever but it, it doesn't matter and i think you know i think there's like this pedestal of like being able to support yourself with your work it, it like it like puts this this stress for me anyway it puts this like weird stress on on what it is you're doing and it, it like it, it sort of it like i don't know it takes something out of it when when it shouldn't and for some people, they can rock rock out, and they can just pump stuff out and sell it, and 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 um, you know, more power to them. But I, I've always really struggled with that sort of like making stuff to make money or making stuff to, for other people, um, whether it's my work or whether it's their design and I'm making it for them. Um, but I, I I think like I you know I've known some people and they they do their own thing to make money or you know they they do other stuff to make money and then they make their own stuff and they sort of like split their sort of creative or their, their time in, in a way where it feeds two different parts of the equation and um I, I think i think i would have been a little happier if i 
uh, had that honest conversation about each side of that equation, you know, like being able to pay bills and stuff like that, but still like be creative uh, at the same time. Because like, you know, it, like it's been a while since I've made something for myself, you know, or not for somebody else, you know, some fancy person that wants some stupid thing in their mouth. And it's just like, uh, I, I, and it, it's easy to say, you know, it's easy to go down that rabbit hole of like, I'll, I'll, I can do that. I can do that. You know, it's cool. Pay me the money, whatever. I'll do it. But it's just like, um, you know, before you know it, it's just your, your own ability to crit critically and creatively about what it is that you originally wanted to do or, or, or what originally drove you in the first place to like, you know, do whatever, do that thing, you know, your, your, your weird artwork that, you know, and, and it's just like, it's so easy for that to just like get all muddled up with, with the outside world. And for me, it was really hard because like I, I would make something and put my all into it. And if I sold it, you know, I, you know, it was, it was just so draining. And um, like, I wasn't getting any of that, that like, I wasn't getting the energy back. And, um, and that's something I still struggle with, um, just sort of time management between other people's wants versus, you know, stuff that I should make for myself, you know, regardless of if I need to pay the bills or not. <laughs> um, and, yeah. uh, you know, wh whether it's just a few minutes and, and just like, you know, doing a little thing, it doesn't always have to be a giant thing that you have to, you know, outdo yourself. Also like outdoing yourself all the time is a little exhausting and not always necessary. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm hearing a trend here. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> right a little bit of like go easy on yourself it's okay and yeah yeah no i love that uh preserving a little slice of your practice even if you want to be working with clients even if you're focused on making money for you know for any reason whether it's very legit you know have to pay your rent or not making sure you're preserving a piece of your creative practice for yourself yeah totally yeah Brittany, how about you Okay, one thing that um, what Brennan was saying um, reminded me of was learning to say no. I did not, I could not say no to anything at PAFA because I was in this mindset of like everything's an opportunity and I need to like rack up opportunities, things that I did on my resume, you know, to get internships, to get to grad school, to get to the career that I want. Da, da, da. Um, but that leads to serious burnout. Um, and I say like, you know, learn to say no, but really teach yourself, teach yourself. Like I had to, um, my boss had to explain to me through a book that he read called The Power of a Positive No. And when he explained this to me, it like, it clicked. It was, um, I think I, as an illustrator and someone who's client, you know, likes client relationships, I always want to say, yes, yes, I can do that for you. Sure. That no, I can, I can have it in that amount of time. No problem. Um, but for me, I had to, um, be able to, to say no, but also a little bit of yes to satisfy my desire to, to say, yes, I can do something for you. So a positive no was like, um, no, I can't, uh, I can't have that for you in this amount of time, but let's let's look at what you need and see if there's something that I can do that's just a smaller scale or you know something like that. You have to reframe it. Or I may not be able to help, but I know a colleague and I can put you in touch with them. So being able to feel helpful, also say no, is the way that I learned how to say no a little bit easier. Um, then practically, be, um, this is maybe hard. Uh, I'm not like naturally organized at all, but I appear so. And that's because I need to create like systems and structure to make this uh, work. So I would say like write down the workflows that work for you in your studio practice, the ones that don't, like keep good records, keep good photos of things, progress photos works in progress, like qualities, uh, photos like that. Um, and then the, the last one is that sometimes done is better than perfect. Mm. <laughs> That's the truth. Heard that one. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's great. That's all a lot, a lot of talk about boundaries, you know, creating healthy boundaries and how that helps you and other people potentially. Uh, yeah, I love that. And I would and if, second the, uh, the documenting your work at the end is really hard because the last thing you want to do is look at it anymore. <laughs> and you really, it's like, oh, I'm, all my, a lot of my stuff is all at other people's places. And then now it's like, I call them up and go to their house. And it's just like, yeah, just keep good records of your stuff. Um, you'll, you'll be happy you did that. Definitely. Love it. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap up here in just a minute. Um, I have a couple of questions from Sean, uh, which we've kind of covered, but I, I want to just ask them again. So for Brendan, you mentioned your type of work and how the flow is not necessarily consistent. Have you noticed any impacts or had any had to make any adjustments since the pandemic? Um, my, I, my, I had a big job in Manhattan that was delayed because of COVID. Um, I don't remember how long it was delayed, but like everything shut down. I mean, nobody was, you know, doing anything like in the beginning, but. And supply chain must be huge for you, right? The what? The supply chain issues that are hitting everybody must be a huge problem for you. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the beginning, it, it was, it, it was like, I definitely took a little bit of hit. I, especially on some of the material increases that, that were happening. Like I, I could have just been a pain in the ass and just like upcharged everything that to my clients and just been like, look, I'm getting slammed with, you know, charges that didn't exist when I quoted this, but like, I was so eager just to get started that I, I was just like, well, I'll eat, I'll eat the, the material cost difference just so we can just get the ship rolling. And, um, but, um, yeah, I mean, everything was just slower, really. And like in the beginning, like when I would go on site and there was like 10 contractors running around doing 50 different things, um, it was annoying. You know, there was a, there was a, a, a boss man who was just, you know, yelling at everybody the whole time. And, um, you know, everybody had to just sign in and constantly check their temperature and masks and, you know, but that, that didn't last very long. I, aside from that, and like, I mean, I know material prices now are, are certainly... Uh, a little ridiculous and you know in a lot of different ways but um yeah so like that like speaking of burnout just mentioned earlier like i that job burned me out hard and um i uh i've been on the road for 10 months because wow. i i so burned out now it's like i'm i i went to 30 national parks almost and uh so i'm i'm like super stoked that i have been working for 10 months <laughs> are you almost ready to go back or no i mean <laughs> I, I, I do everything that i've <laughs> learned how to do in the last 10 years, 10 years um but i mean we'll see like i, I you know like i do some people email me about some jobs and it's just like no i don't want to do that <laughs> but like yeah, they're, you know, it's like learn to say no. Like there's some things that are just like, I could do that, but I'm not the best person for the job. You know, you should call this person. That's not me. Um, and uh, I, I, yeah. So, well, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm in like, at the moment, I'm in this weird ether of, uh, you know, retirement that I don't want to come out of. But uh <laughs> If we had you know, time, I would, I would get everybody's story of like, what's next? Like, where are we, where are we going here? But you guys are off the hook because I don't have any, any time for that. And I think Sean's other question for Brittany, we kind of covered, which was about um, transition from, John, from Johns Hopkins to CHOP. And it sounds like it was pretty direct, right? You just basically got a job out of school. Is that true for um, other people you went to school with? Were jobs aplenty? Um, this was 2019, right, so right before the pandemic, and fortunately, yeah, it was a really good year for hiring recent graduates. Um, so before we finished out the year, um, the school year, everyone in my class had a job. We all interviewed, we did portfolio reviews we had, and visits, and we had to do all that. But yeah, it was a good year for that. Um, it was, yeah, and I took a two-week, I think a two-week break. Then I went to a conference for our association of medical illustrators with my new bosses. And then it was right into work, but it did take some time to figure out how like the organization of CHOP worked. Um, I took some time shadowing different teams just to get a lay of the land. 
and see um, clinical teams, research teams in action um, and shadowing like my boss on some of his client meetings to see how he ran things. It was a little bit of transition. Great, thank you. Um, thanks everybody so much for being here and sharing all of this. I wish we could keep talking for another hour because it's so interesting and you guys are amazing. So thanks, thanks so much for sharing everything with us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's been nice to reflect. There's so much there in terms of the behind the scenes and what it feels like. And, and, and the biggest thing that I got from all three of you, which I love is keep moving forward, like one step in one foot in front of the other and trust that it's going to land somewhere, you know, that you're going to, if you just keep moving forward and, and being open to the opportunities that show up, that that's, it's the moving forward part that's, that a lot of people don't get, right? That you sort of get stuck and don't, don't do the thing, don't continue doing the thing without knowing where the end point is. Like people insist on kind of trying to know that end point and that's the thing you can't know. And especially as an artist, I'm sure, you know, Brittany, you aside where this is like actually your dream job that you already knew. For the most part, artists, they don't know where they're going to end up, right? They don't know what it's going to look like 10 years down the line. Um, and when it works out and it, there's a little bit of survivor bias there, obviously, like when, you know, the people we talk to are the ones who make it, but um, that like, there's a, the, everything I've heard on, when I've interviewed all these different artists on my podcast is all about just making a thing because you're curious about it, making relationships, continuing to follow down those those paths. And so I, I loved hearing the differences between how all three of you have done that. All right. Thanks everybody. And uh, I think we'll call it a night. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. All right. Bye. Good Bye -bye. To see everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Autonomous Creative. Our show is produced by Matt Madden. Our production coordinator is Lucina Boyhandian. And our production assistant is Rhiannon Sunday. Music is by Matt Madden, and I'm your host, Jessica Abel. You can find all our takeaways, as well as any links and extras we mentioned today, plus transcripts in the show notes. Find everything you need at acpod.show. If you enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll subscribe, and it would help us immensely if you would take a second and pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It just takes a few seconds, but it's actually a huge help to us and to our guests to get this podcast suggested to new listeners. We appreciate your help so much, and we'll see you next time on The Autonomous Creative.